All right. We're on, and we're going to get started here in just a minute. And thanks to those of you who are joining, perhaps uh, on YouTube after the event. We will get started here in just a minute. Uh, the topic for this evening is uh, on long-range forecasting, and maybe more appropriately, mid-range forecasting, not really long-range, but the 7- the to 14-day period. Uh, and this time of year can produce some very interesting things, especially if you're following uh, weather folks on social media. So we're going to talk about that tonight and wait just a, a minute or two. We've got one more that uh, one more person is going to be joining us hopefully shortly here. If not, we'll get started in just a minute. So, Bo, was last year the those a couple of big events? That's probably the biggest winter you've had in a while up in southern Illinois, huh? Well, <clears throat> so no, I am West Kentucky. West Kentucky, West Kentucky. had yeah double digit snows uh, back to back late February and then into March. Pretty unusual. It's unusual to have a d double digit snowstorm with ten or more inches anyway, but to have two back to back is a bit much. Uh, the second one I think produced up to twenty inches in isolated areas of West Kentucky. Shut down I twenty four. Yeah, uh, yeah, hundreds of vehicles stranded. National Guard had to come out. It uh, seems that that happens every so many years, almost like clockwork. We get one of those systems. Well, I think I remember I was looking back. I use uh, Time Hop, and I was looking back, and I think a couple years ago, maybe three years ago, the Southern Illinois basketball team was stranded on uh, the interstate from a snowstorm. Let me flip through here. I'm trying to trying to remember. It's, it was today, and that's the only reason it kind of – Sparked my mind as it was. It was either today or yesterday. Um, yeah, Southern Illinois basketball team may have been on my Facebook uh, memories thing, but yeah, it was. Uh, it's been at least two, maybe three years ago. Yeah, the basketball team spent the night. Southern Illinois men's team spent the night on the bus because they couldn't get off the interstate. Wow. Um, yeah, That's yeah we were really we were getting really cold here two years ago because. Um, I think we had some like flash freezing. Yeah, it was. It was two years ago. Sporting news: the Southern Illinois basketball team is spending night on the team bus after they got stranded in a quote unquote blizzard. I don't think it was a blizzard, but yeah, they were <laughs> stuck on they were stuck on Interstate 57. Yeah. Wow. But I, I think that, that. May have, yeah it may have been. Uh, let's see where they were stuck. Uh, they made it home to Carbondale. They were stuck between Carbondale and Normal. Yeah. What, About two uh, what, hours, two hours north of Carbondale. Yeah. What was the date on that storm? Uh, today, it was. Uh, that's the only reason I knew about it is it came up today, uh, January January six, two thousand fourteen. I guess, I guess it happened today, and then they got home. Yeah, it was January. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Wow. All right. Um, I think we're going to go ahead and get started here, and uh, we will have. One other person joining us here in a little bit when they when they uh, get into the broadcast studio up there in Jonesboro. But uh, welcome everybody who's following along tonight, uh, who may be watching this after the fact um, on YouTube. Uh, this is a uh, Google Plus Hangout that uh, we decided to hold here tonight, just because there's uh, it seems to be a, a kind of a timely topic, I guess. Uh, and I'll start off by introducing those who are uh, going to be on the panel tonight. And we'll start with um, Bo Dodson, who is in uh, southern Illinois, western Kentucky area. Uh, and he runs uh, weatherobservatory.com, uh, is the meteorologist for uh, the county Paducah is in, I believe, McCracken County for the Emergency Management Agency there. Um, and uh, glad to have Bo on with us tonight. How are you, Bo? I'm, I'm doing really well. I'll correct one thing is I've resigned from the McCracken County uh, Emergency Management as meteorologist uh, when I started my new company, Weather Talk uh, LLC. Sort of broadened what I was doing, but there was a little bit of conflict of interest there, so switched it up a little bit, but still work with them. Gotcha. Sorry about that. I must have been reading an old bio there. It's okay. Okay. Um, yeah, good. Good to uh, have you with us tonight, though. And um, and we've we've been conversing the last couple of days over this topic, and uh, uh, Bo's got some really good points to make as well. So we're looking forward to the discussion on that. The other uh, gentleman joining us tonight is uh, no stranger to uh, hangouts with MemphisWeather.net. That's John Maddox, uh, and he is our educated consumer tonight. And so welcome back to another hangout, John. 
Thanks a lot. I don't know about that, uh, but I did stay at Holiday Inn Express uh, last Wednesday night or Tuesday night in Birmingham. So I guess I feel the role of educated consumer tonight. Gotcha. Cool. Yeah, that was. Uh, yeah, we we both took that trip down to Birmingham last week, and uh, one of the things I'll remember the most is not necessarily what came out of the stadium at, in the uh, Birmingham Bowl, but was driving down Highway 78 through Holly Springs and seeing yeah. trees snapped in half for three quarters of a mile uh, from the tornado on December 23rd. So, uh, you, something you know, that's some, that's something you see, and and you know, we've unfortunately seen it several times here in the Mid South, but you're just never quite ready for it. Even that long after the fact, it was just devastation was unreal. Yeah, definitely. So uh, the other uh, individual will be joining us here shortly uh, will be Ryan Vaughn. Um, and many of you from the Mid-South will know Ryan. He is uh, the chief meteorologist up at KAIT-TV in Jonesboro, Arkansas. Uh, he will be getting into the studio shortly and joining us here midstream. So uh, we'll welcome him when he gets on as well. But he'll also be part of the conversation tonight. So I want to lay some, uh, just kind of lay it out what the, the groundwork is, what we're, our discussion is going to be about tonight. Um, and that is with the uh, winter season now on us. Um, um, we have seen in the past and are seeing uh, even more uh, this year already the prevalence of some uh, medium to long range forecasts that are being shared on social media. Um, many of them have to do uh, with winter storms on the long term horizon basically. Um, you know, the initial model runs starting to pick up on something in say the, the 10 to 15 day period um, and those graphics and um, and the forecasts that come out of those or outlooks that come out of those get shared uh, on social media and uh, then we end up with a lot of people asking a lot of questions. Um, I've gotten several questions about uh, one in particular and um, about what the impacts are because Memphis was right in the middle of a swath of supposed heavy snow or at least some type of winter storm and arctic blast for next week. Um, and so we got a lot of discussion that can take place around that uh, particular topic. One of the things I want to make sure that uh, we get out of this conversation as well before we get done tonight is um, because this is, you know, most of you that are watching our, our general public, um, I want to make sure that we also touch on um, how you can what, what you can do when you see these kind of things coming across your Facebook feed or your Twitter feed, how you can be um, an educated consumer of this uh, particular information and, and some of the maybe the rules of the road um, as far as um, handling of that because uh, blindly sharing these things is probably not the right way to go. I think we'll, we'll come to that opinion fairly quickly here. Um, but I think there's a lot of different reasons why these things are shared. Um, some of them uh, good-natured or good good intent. Um, some of them are, are simply what we would call clickbait um, or just basically a way to draw followers, to draw shares, um, to have something out there that's uh, on the extreme basically to to just draw the attention. Um, and that's not what everybody is doing with these. I'll, I'll caveat that right here at the beginning. That's, that's not the purpose of of some of them, um, but um, I think that there's uh, there's some discussion to be had around that topic. So um, that's kind of the the base of what we're going to talk about tonight. Um, I did put out a blog uh, yesterday uh, on this topic. You can find it at blog.memphisweather.net, um, and then right up at the top there's a uh, link to a subject called on hypecasts. I call these hypecasts because they are basically long-range forecasts that just try and get people all in a in a frenzy, um, something to talk about. Um, and very frequently they don't pan out the way that they are uh, perceived or or that the way that they are produced. Um, so some and, and a lot of times these things are I think. Uh, kind of wrapped in some amount of truth. Um, so for instance next week we do have an Arctic blast coming in. It is going to get cold um, and when some of the models start to pick up on some potential precip maybe as the system is moving out um, then those kind of graphics get shared. And so that's the that's kind of the uh, the topic we were going to work with tonight. Um, and I think I think how we'll start this is basically um, you know, from a from a meteorology perspective, and I'm gonna I'm gonna ask Bo to chime in here on this as well. Um, I think there are some right ways and wrong ways to communicate 
these long-range forecast ideas. Um, and from my from my perspective, um, because of the fact that so much of this information is available to just about anybody these days, from you know whether it's a, a 13 or 14 year old that has just got an interest in weather, like I did when I was that age. Um, you know, you have access to all this information that we didn't have access to when I was that age, um, and then you've got social media available. It makes it very easy to take that information and and push it out there. Um, so uh, I think the access to the information is a big part of that. Um, but I think there's right and wrong wrong ways to communicate that. So Bo, do you want to you want to maybe jump in here and just talk for a little bit about what kind of what your philosophy is on on sharing of that type of information and and what you maybe wrap that in when you do share it. Sure, yeah. <clears throat> so what I try to do is a multi-pronged approach to this. Social media exploded on the scene a few years ago. None of us really understood what would come of it. Now we see what's come of it. And you're right, when I was a, when I was a kid, my grandmother would drive me over to Paducah, Kentucky, about 30 minutes, just to go see the radar at the flight service station and some nice people there. They would save their facsimile maps for me, and uh, occasionally, on a good day, if they weren't busy, she would pick up the phone and actually dial a phone number that would pull up a radar somewhere where there were thunderstorms. So we've gone from that to what we have today, which is radar at our fingertips on our cell phones, let alone our computers. Uh, I never dreamed we would have the amount of information we have access to. So you're right. It's anybody can access this, and if you pay a little bit of money, you can either get a subscription site to see all the models. And uh, what that's brought about is, and I'm sure I would have done the same when I was a kid, is we get these young people who are very enthusiastic and they want to become meteorologists, and they start posting day 10 snowfall maps. And with a little bit of disclaimer, oftentimes you'll see them say, this probably won't happen, but this is what the model is showing. And uh, so then it spreads, and uh, I always get asked, somebody will tag me in the post or share it with me, and sometimes private message me and ask me, what do you think about this? Or we get a snowstorm coming in. And I tell them, well, try to explain to them that this is a day 10 model forecast and that we do a good job if we can forecast snowfall two days out and normally I tell people uh, that 24 hours in advance is 24 to 36 hours is a good time to start forecasting amounts sure we can give a general idea the intensity of a storm if it's going to produce a lot of snow or maybe a general one to three inches when we start talking about specifics, it really comes down to about 24 to 36 hours out. So I try to explain this. I have a weather blog, weathertalk.com, and I, I go into more detail there during active weather. Then on Facebook, I try to explain everything with, with some maps, answer questions. One thing that I am big on is if you ask me a question, 99% of the time I'm going to answer it. It is social media after all. And I try to educate people that a one-sentence forecast normally isn't going to tell the whole story. And uh, that leads into the other topic of, of these apps that do the same things that these kids are doing. And uh, I'm constantly asked about that day seven or eight snowstorm. Matter of fact, five times today I've already been asked about a snowstorm next week. And I ask, where did you hear this? And they say, well, my app. you know. And then I have to explain to them that that's not a human forecast that this is generated by computers and if you check it later in the day the forecast is probably going to change but people don't understand this because they think well this is this is my app from this television station and I'm told to trust these forecasters and so this app this must be their forecast and then trying to explain to them that no that's not really the way it is so there's kind of two things going on here one are the young enthusiastic amateur weather watchers or whatever you want to call them uh, and sometimes it's adults as well uh, and then you also have these apps that are doing basically the same thing because a kid posts a day 10 map and the apps going to post a day 10 forecast thing about the app is there's usually no disclaimer the kid may say hey this is probably not going to happen I'm just showing you this the app actually has a very official looking forecast that looks like it's actually from the National Weather Service it will give you the high the low uh, it will give you the percentage chance of, of snow. It will tell you two to three inches. Very specific forecast. 
so this is a problem as well. And uh, I guess people really love snow because they like to share these snow posts quite frequently, and sometimes tens of thousands of shares, which is amazing uh, to think about. But once it's out there, it spreads like wildfire. Inevitably, I have to answer questions about it. But more and more, I'm being asked about these app forecasts, which to yeah. me is an equal problem. All right. Yeah, there's there's uh, definitely different things that are are driving all this. Welcome, Ryan. I want to uh, welcome Ryan in from uh, KAIT in Jonesboro. Got your tie on. You're all ready for the broadcast tonight. Uh, I'm ready. Can you hear me? I can. Yeah, you sound good. Okay, good. Thanks so much for joining. Hi, no problem. And so you've got your snow forecast for this Sunday already as well. Uh, yes, uh, I'm going with a total of flurries. A total of flurries. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> um, so the the initial discussion here kind of is a, is just around um, how we what the, what we feel the best way of communicating some of these long range forecasts. We know that um, you know you're not going to just stop at seven days if you're seeing something with some amount of right. Uh, some amount of confidence, or at least you have a, a trend in one direction. So, and I know you you use your blog to to discuss that as well, and and kind of talk about that kind of thing. So, where 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 do you stand on you know when you see something, how far out you'll start mentioning it, or how do you how do you wrap it? You know, I, I kind of gauge it. I kind of gauge it on um, how much chatter there is out there already. Um, because kind of as Bo was saying a little bit, it, it's going to be out there. So you need to either get ahead of it or to at least explain the what could and couldn't happen with it. Um, you know, because people are already going to start asking you on Twitter and on Facebook and things, uh, well, hey, what about 10 days from now? What about 11 days from now? So uh, in my opinion, you need to jump out there and, and either be the voice of reason um, I rarely ever talk about, um, I guess, some of the posts that you see out there uh, that sometimes um, are clickbait. And the reason I don't, let's say 10 days out, someone says, big snowstorm. And I'm like, eh, it could, it couldn't. You know, things can go back and forth. And I dog that person out for it. If it snows 8 inches 10 days later, you gave them validity. You know what I'm saying? So, um, you know, I, I, I try not to ever dog anyone out on that. Um, but what I like to do is go on my blog and say, here's what we're looking. Here's the possibility. Here's what can change. Stay tuned. Uh, that's how I approach it. Well, whether it's right or wrong, I don't know. Yeah, no, I think that's a that's the right kind of approach and you're right that if you don't get ahead of it um, then then you know you're just basically going to be inundated if from from our perspective anyway you know having the information and and being kind of the experts or whatever you want you know whatever you want to say in the field is um, you know it's if somebody is asking it then that probably means at least 10 other people are thinking it or they've seen it or whatever and they they would like to know what what their trusted source uh, has to say about it. Right. Um, so, yeah, that's... that's. Uh, well, uh, we recently saw some research also that people want to know what is coming. Even if you have to rail it back in, you know, if there's a severe weather event 10 days from now, people want to know that there's a chance of severe weather. Now, if four days out from that event, you have to say, well, okay, you know what? It's starting to look like the low is going to pass south of us. Severe weather is not going to hit. Um, then they're okay with that. They would rather have, uh, the, from what the research showed, is that they would rather have a heads up and you reel that back in than uh, to not start talking about it. Because you know, at least in the TV world, we used to we used to play this little game where seven days out on the seven day forecast, if it looked like you know, a huge snowstorm was seven days out, we would kind of go, oh, yeah, and a little 20% chance day seven. Um, and I think those days are gone. Now, uh, am I going to get on there and go, you know, 100% chance of snow, you know, seven-day forecast, seven days out? No, I'm not going to do that, but we're not going to tiptoe around what could come also. So, John, what is the – from a – from the perspective of just uh, you know the user of these types of forecasts, I mean, what what would you prefer to see? Um, would you prefer to see uh, a heads up on something that may be coming down the road, and then 
tweak it as we go along, or does that? Do you think that that just um, puts the meteorologists in in the place where, um, well, they always say something's going to happen and then it never does, which is you know what we're always trying to fight as well. Right, and I think both end up happening. But you know, folks like you and Ryan. You know, you do a great job, and I'll read Ryan's blog. He'll say, now, here's what may happen, you know, or I, I think giving folks a heads up is very important, especially with winter weather here in our part of the country. We don't get it very often, so if there's a, re, you know, a better than remote chance that we might get some, I think it's important for, you know, and Bo can probably speak to this, being with, working with the EMAs, and, and you guys both can as well, it's important to at least give somebody a heads up and say, hey, you know, this is what could happen um, I, I just think that the fighting the battle with the public, just kind of in general, when you're 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 going to win some and you're going to lose some, you're going to have that group of folks that say, "Oh, those guys, they don't know what they're talking about." You know, Ryan Vaughn hadn't got a forecast right in 20 years. Never mind, he's worked for five. You know, and it's going to be. It's that, I mean, it's going to you're going to be fighting that battle anyway. Um, most people I know prefer to know a little bit in advance, but I, you know, not to get way off here, but you know, a meteorologist who used to work at the Weather Channel now works somewhere else posted a temperature map, Eric. You, you know what I'm talking about this afternoon of the 5,000-foot Euro model for, t a, what, like a week out? And that kind of thing causes confusion when you put things, even in the enterprise, you put things out there with no real explanation where, you know, that's where I think the problem comes is as long as you put something out and say, hey, you know, here is what might happen in five days, here's why we're thinking this might happen, or, you know, use use a lot of code words, things like, you know, what people don't understand about models is they're not necessarily predictors, they just kind of show a pattern, especially that far out, and what could come of this pattern. So, you know, I, I think that putting that information out in and of itself can be a bad thing, but if you put it out with an explanation, I think I think Ryan's dead on. I think you know even me as a somewhat in I consider myself a somewhat informed, uh, you know weather consumer, you know I I don't want to just see a model run of you know the tail end of a storm and it shows the blue snowflakes you know in the area and you know and I'm some I don't want to see that I want to see I want to see what you you know what do you think because. I think that when people in rely, especially people in the private enterprise, probably even more so than TV, I think today people rely on you guys as trusted sources. And these maps go out that even the enterprise puts out, and people are like, what is that? You know, And then that just starts the question. So I just think it's critical if you're going to put those things out at least, you know, like Ryan does with his blog, at least you do, and, and you know, I'm sure Bo does, just, just at least back it up and say, hey, here's why we think this, and here's what could realistically happen and what, you know, climatology says. You know, we were joking off air earlier that if the Mid-South is waiting on moisture or is waiting on cold air to meet up with moisture, moisture is always going to outrun the cold air. That's what climatology says, you know, and not necessarily science, but it just says that historically around here, that's what's going to happen. So I think Ryan's right. I think people are willing to accept you know, hey, it's seven days out. Here's what could happen in day two. You go, you know what? It just this doesn't look like it's going to happen. And yeah, you know, I just I think that people want to know. And if I think if people didn't want to know, they wouldn't ask. You know, because yeah, right. You know, pe people in general have enough going on in our lives. If they weren't concerned about it, they wouldn't share that map four hundred times on yeah. Facebook. Like I saw a particular map. So, so you know, um. I, th I thought I'd just piggyback on that real quick. Sorry, Ryan. I'll come right back to you. Um, so we did a uh, – I put a Twitter poll out this afternoon, and this goes right back to what we were just talking about. Um, 315 responses at this point, and the question was when you see a forecast for severe storms or winter weather 10 to 15 days out, what do you do with the information? And this was posed to you know, just, just my followers, and then you guys retweeted it. Um, and so almost half of the responses said that they will keep that in the back of their mind. In other words, they they appreciate the fact that you have given them the information, and they know that right now I don't really need to make any massive, you know, changes of plans or big decisions based on it. But I want to know that it was there so that I can continue to follow the forecast, whatever. Um, very, there was a very small percentage that said they would at that point start planning ahead. Uh, about an equal percent said they would start checking other sources, which I think is a is actually 
probably one of the best answers on there. I think if you see that from one source, you need to go and check with other sources. You need to, especially if it's something that was shared to you through Facebook and it was shared a million times and so you don't even know who the person is that shared it, check with the person who you do trust um, to, to answer that. And then uh, a third of the respondents said they would laugh hysterically and that's, you know, I think that has some validity as well, you know, because I think people don't, at 10 to 15 days out, they know this is not something that is necessarily going to play out exactly as uh, as it was intended. So, um, yeah, that that was the way that ran ahead. John, you had something real quick here. Yeah, just and I'm sure we'll cover this later. But just you know, one rule that I have when you said check other sources is if I see something, you know, back in college, we all learned that if it's a true false or high school, if it's a true false question, you see the word always or every time in the question, you should typically just dismiss that and it's always going to be false. I think if you see the words historic, crippling, extreme, you know, any of those words, I think that is a good time to take a step back before you share it, take a step back and check somewhere else and see if somebody else reporting that, is somebody else showing this. And I think that, you know, a lot of times your questions will be answered in about two seconds when you see that there's one guy out of four thousand, what do they call, what is, uh, what do the weather brains call, call people, socio, uh, social media, media ologist, yeah. um, you know, sharing that kind of stuff. Yeah. Mediaologist. And I think, I think that's a good way, another good telltale sign that should run up a red, red flag when they use words like historic and crippling and, yeah. and extreme and, you know, devastating. Uh, Ryan. Yeah. I was just going to tell you, um, let me see if I can screen. My mouse is not working worth a flip right now. Um, let's see. Da, 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 da. Can you guys see that? Yep. Okay. We can go in through here. I know Bo has been talking about this on social media. We can go through here and edit everything that we put into our app. And that is big for us. Um, and, and because... If this was all computer model driven, uh, then it might say something weird eight days out or something. So on Sunday, you know, if you notice here, I've put in a few flurries. I can go in there and edit and put whatever I want in here. And that was really big for us when, uh, when we made that turn on our app because there were times when we would go on air and it wouldn't match what we had, or it would say snow and we're thinking rain. Now we can put all this in here and hit uh, publish to air. So um, that's one thing. Let me see if I'm back. Am I back now? There we go. Uh, that's one thing that uh, I think helps. You know, some people say all apps are the same, and they're not the same. Even if everybody had the same app that we had, you still have to go in there and edit it. You know, and some people don't. So, right, well. that's a big deal. WSIL Town Three in Illinois. One of the things they told their vendor uh, was, "We want to stop at day five or seven, and we want to edit it." And, and that's the way to do these apps. As long as you have control of your app, I mean, that's the key to it. Yep. Yeah, and, and people need to think about something else as we, we talk about apps here, too. And, and just, you know, a lot of this comes back to common sense, right? I, if, I, if I have the Weather Channel app on my phone, and I have to think how many millions of downloads they've had, they cannot possibly be generating a forecast for every single locale in the country. Just if you stop and think about the enormity of it, and just think about, well, they can give a forecast for Atlanta, Georgia, for Memphis, for Boston, for Los Angeles. How many people they would have to have just just to do that, just to generate those forecasts? And I, I think that that people, and that's why I said earlier, the public's common sense battle. You're going to lose more than you're going to win. But if people will just stop and think about that for a second, that you know. And the other side is, Eric, how long have you lived in Memphis? Uh, Thirty years. Long? Yeah, Brian, how long have you been in uh, Region Eight? A uh, total of 14 years. Bo, how long have you been in Southern Illinois? Uh, 45 years. <laughs> so, and I've been here my entire life. So, who's going to know the weather better here? And we'll just speak about Memphis. Eric or some computer programmer sitting in a cubicle in Atlanta, Georgia. At, and I'm not picking on the Weather Channel. I mean, they're, right. you know, personally. But, but that's that's where I think we have to get, and that's why I think that it's so critical what you guys all do 
as that trusted source that helps folks like me understand is you are local, you're live, you, you, you know how things work around here, you know things don't, you know, where did the storms go before the interstates in, in the 1960s, how did the storms know to track up I-40, um, you know, and, and those are things that I think people need to think about is, you know, local is, a, this is a case where local is always better. Right, yeah. I agree. I agree about that. I last year uh, when the interstate closed, two days before the interstate closed that snowstorm, I told people uh, interstates may close, which is a bold statement because it doesn't happen very often. The only reason I knew that is because I've witnessed it two or three times in my area, and I know what it takes to cause that to happen. In any in the interstate, I-24 was closed down. Hundreds of people were stranded. So local forecasters, they know these things, and, and that's why it's important to trust the local forecasters, not saying that the Weather Channel or Weather Nation doesn't do a great job at what they do, but when it comes right down to it, your local meteorologist should and almost always will know more about what's going on and can answer your questions about that. So here's here's another um, another thing on the apps as well. You know, a lot of the a lot of the national weather companies, um, you know, they have the apps that are driven either by a certain model or they're driven by their proprietary model. You know, they have come up with their own uh, formulas and so forth or, or um, programming to, to be able to create kind of their own version of uh, a particular local high-res model that can cover the United States. Um, but we have this resource out here called the National Weather Service um, who has local people meteorologists all around the uh, all around the country and they're producing these forecasts that now when you go to you know weather.gov which is the National Weather Service homepage and click on a point you get a point forecast for your location and it has been it is driven some by models i have seen the process work so it is a, it is a, a somewhat model driven but it is it is um, you know massaged or right. updated basically by the meteorologist working in your area. And so when I went in and designed um, uh, my Stormwatch Plus app, which is a national app that gives forecasts for the entire nation, the forecasts in that app come from the National Weather Service. So if you're in Seattle and you want the forecast for Seattle, you, you get it through that app, but you're not getting it from a model. You're getting it from your forecasters that are local to Seattle. And I thought, and I think that's a, a you know, a big point there as well that there's different ways of getting these, and if you know what where that data comes from in your app, then you can make uh, a little bit more informed decisions as well. So, Ryan, did you want to jump in? Well, I was wondering how does that work? I, I have, past 48 hours, how are those pinpoint forecasts generated from the weather service? Yeah, um, I, I will. I would it would be good to have a weather service employee on here, but I've kind of watched the the process um, as they did it, and basically the the data is pre-populated in from typically some sort of a blend of multiple models, and then they can go in and basically with a graphical editor massage those data. So if they want the cold front to move a little bit faster, they can basically pull you know the temp the colder temperatures in faster by basically drawing and and moving those um, you know the winds shifting and all of that kind of thing. So so it is something that they can go in and, and manipulate but it's it's not just it's not a captive to a single model where you know if the euro is wrong then and they go with the euro or the GFS then it throws the whole forecast off so they typically use some sort of a blend is the way that I've seen it done gotcha I've had a lot of success with uh, educating my followers one is I have a lot of respect for my followers and I try to to educate them when they ask me a question and over the last few years especially with this sharing of dramatic weather posts whether it's winter storms tornado outbreaks whatever it might be is to go in there and explain to them look this this is what's going on this is why that map was posted this is what that map represents and just explain it to them in layman terms and I know the Capital Weather Gang, uh, Dr. Marshall Shepard, he does this, James Spann, and you see them, uh, like Dr. Marshall Shepard has his television show, Weather Geeks, to try to educate the public because there's an appetite for this, obviously. People love to know about the weather. And if we just take some time and interact with them on Facebook or, what, or Twitter, whatever social media outlet there is, 
they will listen and you'll start to see less and less of these dramatic posts shared because I've seen it in my own feed that my followers are learning not to do this or are learning to point it out to me and tag me and I'll go in there and I'll explain something to them about what that math actually means. And the second prong of that is mentoring. I've had a number of young people, parents will contact me, my kids interested in weather, and I will, one, uh, hook them up with the National Weather Service and see if someone from the Weather Service can talk to the parents and have that kid come down there and visit the station or and or hook them up with a television station uh, in my local area and they'll go in and do a tour with the local meteorologist and then interact with them some through email. I've got a couple of kids that email me back and forth and what I've tried to do with them is to educate them about not posting these day 10 snowstorms or whatever it might be and educating them about the models and that you're going to see dramatic weather on the models in the long range but not to you know don't necessarily trust that and certainly don't go out there and start posting about it and I've and the kids that I've worked with they've listened and they continue to learn and maybe one day go on to be meteorologists but I think it's important not to dismiss obviously these young weather enthusiasts but we need to mentor them one way or another and there's enough of us out there that you know we can do this it just takes some time and patience. Yeah, and and but one thing I, I do want to say that that as a as a weather geek, I guess would be a correct term for me. Um, I, I think what happens sometimes is it's the old adage: Can the algebra teacher teach the second grade why is two plus two? And I think what happens sometimes is those in the enterprise they get caught up in being weather professionals. I think. And the public at large may not always understand, um, you know, and, and you, you mentioned Dr. Shepard, who I think is a great follow on Twitter, but if you're not of a certain, um, I don't know the right way to say this without sounding terrible, but if, but if you're not pretty intricately involved, folks like Joe Bastardi and, and uh, Dr. Shepard, who are very smart and do a great job of social media, they can lose you or they can be very confusing I think at times and and I think that and not dumbing down things but I think that explaining things in a way that general public can understand is also just really critical but you're you're dead on Bo if, if we ignore even those of us who are not in the business but those of us who you know have friends that know I have an interest in weather if we ignore the next generation then what's going to happen is you're going to have a room full of 10-day snow maps and no explanations or no, you know, we, we have got to do a good job as not only an enterprise that you guys are or, or broadcast as Ryan is, but even folks like me, it's incumbent on me to say, hey, slow down a little bit. You know, yes, the models say that might happen, but, you know, here's what I know that I've lived here my whole life and that's what never happens. So... I just think that it's critical that, yeah, education is important, but educating to your audience is also equally important, I think. Absolutely. I agree. You have to know your audience if you're yeah. talking to uh, just adults or kids or whoever it might be. And you're going to have a mixed mm -hmm. audience on Facebook. I know during winter storms, my Facebook page simply explodes yeah. with people on there. And I try to interact with them, answer the questions. You know, you, you get to know people, too, over time on who you're talking right. with. Maybe they're helping you as a weather spotter and pass on that to the weather service information they give you. But, yeah, knowing your audience is definitely key to to uh, knowing what to say to them. I try to speak in layman terms when it comes to weather because otherwise, I, I just don't understand what's the point uh, of using these big meteorological words if nobody Absolutely. understands them. And I know there's some people that disagree with that, but I mean, look, my goal is to educate the public and help them understand the why behind the weather. Do you guys, as enterprise people, I'll throw this out to all of you, kind of flip the script here a little bit, do you think people really want to know the why, or are they are they is it a is it a split of I want to know ninety percent what, ten percent why, or do you think that that probably varies greatly by consumer? 
it varies, I think. Yeah, I think in this uh, in this day and age, I think there are there's a pretty good split um, where there are a lot of people who are have access to so much information that they um, you know they find that they um, can get the the why more easily perhaps than they used to be, used to be able to, um, and so I think that they are looking for that. On the other hand, I think there's a lot of people that um, that are just looking for the headline. Um, and you know, yeah. Twitter is you know it's good and bad. And part of part of the negative, I think, is that uh, you get sound bites and headlines, and so people just don't aren't as interested in knowing why. They just just tell me what it's going to do, and I'll figure out what to do with it. Ryan, what about you from a TV perspective? I mean, do you think your viewers want to know? Well, it's it's going to snow, and why is it going to snow? Or does TV is it kind of still just tell me what it's going to do? I, I think it's both. I think um, if you if you've ever read my blog, I, I will put out bullet points, and those bullet points are that we think this, this, and this, and usually they're pretty cut and dry. My fifth grader can understand them, uh, and then I say, okay, let's dig in a little deeper. Um, I've learned over the years, um, you dig in a little bit, but you don't have to dig in that deep. Right. People want to know a little bit more, but it's not like um, you know, yeah, they don't want a lesson in meteorology on most you know, of three answers. Hey, but the good news is, Eric, you were saying about Twitter with headlines. Hey, the good news came out today. They're going to increase the limit to 10,000 characters. <laughs> maybe, so, maybe. So, so I can, we can go ahead and put our thesis right into the tweet then. <laughs> right. Rather than yeah. taking a screenshot of it where you can't read it on your phone. <laughs> I might leave Twitter if that happens. I'm, I'm with you. Okay, so let me let me throw out this hypothetical question for each of you, and, and how would you, uh, which way would you go with this? Which which of these, uh, which of these would is is worse? I guess. Would you rather not see a forecast that says three to five inches of snow expected in ten days, or a sixty percent chance of snow in ten days? Which I one do you want to see? I think 60% because I think at that range, I don't need to know exactly. I just need to know that there is a better, 60% would certainly indicate this, a better than average chance that we are going to see snow. And that, you know, here, and, and you know, I'm sure the further north it goes, the less this is true, but here, it doesn't matter how much. If it's going to be, you know, maybe even a, a, a uh, qualifier like a 60% chance of measurable snow, you know, or, or something of that ilk would probably definitely be you know preferable than three to five inches because then you're really just kind of screwing yourself then because if it's if you get one inch you're wrong and if you get nine inches you're wrong so yeah. I like the maybe the quantif qualifier of there's a 60 percent chance of measurable snow I and agree maybe, with that yeah and 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 maybe neither one is probably a really good uh, Forecast to make. I think that's I think that's a better idea. Yeah. the least of the evils, because uh, I can tell you from do, especially at ten days. Now, even at, at five to seven days, um, it's rare that that I'm going to have, at least in my personal forecast, that high of a percentage of anything, um, unless you know everything just lines up. The pattern really, you know, shows a very uh, cohesive, you know, a cohesive pattern that the models have all locked onto. Climatology favors it. Then. You know, then you may go that high, but um, as you, as you notice, if you're a if you're a consumer of weather forecasts out there and you follow day to day, um, you will see that those those if you're going to have a rain event, even even just rain, not snow, that as you get closer in time to that that event happening, the rain chances go up, and it's not because that you know you're going to get more rain or anything like that it's just that the confidence is increasing in the event occurring and so you know it's almost like you know that 80 to 100 percent chance you're really going out on a limb telling people you're gonna get wet that day and you're not gonna do that at seven days out so right this gets into the apps and I what I would like to see the weather community as a whole uh, the weather enterprise is to spend a little more time educating the public about how the forecasts are made in these apps. Like Ryan said, some of them are WSIL3 in Illinois. Some of them are humans behind that forecast, but many, many of them are not. 
the Weather Channel, by the way, it has 50 million downloads. And I spent some time the other day looking through some different apps from different uh, vendors and, and seeing what they were doing. And that's how I know that. And Dr. Shepard sent me a, a thing earlier, a link, that shows that people are now uh, using their apps 23% of the time, people are using weather apps to get their weather forecast. So let's just admit that perhaps the old model of giving people the weather has changed from 20 years ago and that 30 to 40 percent of people are now using either apps or online. So we, we need to educate people about these apps and if you're going to have a 7, 15, 30 day forecast via an app, then let's just explain to people and what their expectations should and should not be. Because if we just continue to ignore this and pretend that the app doesn't represent the person pushing the app, I, I think we're setting ourselves up for failure. If I send somebody to your website and say, hey, I trust this meteorologist, they go to their website and then they see their, that meteorologist saying, download my app, the person I sent there, they download that app, all of a sudden they think that the forecast on that app is coming from this meteorologist who I told them to trust and that app in my opinion is the voice of that meteorologist. If you're going to push an app and tell people that you're a trusted source for weather information, then that app is going to represent you. And I think what's happening is there's a disconnect and that meteorologists, they have these apps out there, but they're, I, I don't think meteorologists quite understand uh, how often those apps are being used and what it's doing behind the scenes to all of us. Because all of a sudden, people today, again as example, are telling me that we're getting five to seven inches of snow next week. They saw it on different apps. And so all of a sudden that becomes meteorologists are forecasting five to seven inches of snow, which is exactly what five different people today messaged and text my phone or online and said, forecasters are saying this. And I said, who told you that? And it ends up being a website or an app. So this is a reflection on all of us as meteorologists or forecasters is that people don't understand the difference. And somehow we've got to spend more time explaining this to people. Sorry, that's my rant. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's good. Um, so, uh, Ryan, do you have a uh, either an AMS or an NWA seal? Uh, NWA. NWA. Okay. Um, do you do you think that uh, that that seal by having that just in and of itself makes you uh, someone that people can trust more because you have that, or does that um, no. Does it matter that you have that at all? No. Okay. Well, I can tell you coming from the IT world that, you know, this is a, the IT world and, and telecom sales, whatever I'm in today, is a world that is driven by certification and driven by the number of letters one can put behind their name. Um, I think it's important. It's it's and Ron will probably tell you this. It's probably much more a sense of accomplishment for him that he did that. Just like any name letters I've got behind my name or anything I've got in my email signature that I was able to accomplish that. But I don't think it gives you any credibility. More credibility. I think if you're if you're a bad weather forecaster and you can have the AMS and the NWA and what was the ridiculous one I saw a couple weeks ago that you can isn't there one that you can buy? I think we saw online somebody was. Was showing that you can pay your two hundred bucks and get it. I don't yeah, think mine's you, in the I mail. Think, yeah, <laughs> uh, I don't. I don't think you. Can, I don't think people pay attention to that as much anymore. And Ryan, you, you're a you're a broadcast guy, so yep. you know you, you you probably know. I mean, I think it's that's more of the TV station wants to feel really good about themselves and say we have the only whatever yeah. certified meteorologist in the market. Blah blah blah. You know what matters more than anything is. Uh, I was there for the Marmaduke Carruthersville tornado. I was right. there for the ice storm. I was there for the Super Tuesday tornado. That's right. This something like this that I've been here over 10 years at this station uh, means more to our yeah. viewers, I think, um, than whatever you can put in the super of my name. Absolutely. Uh, I think you've got to build that trust. Yes. Right. And and on the flip side, I think it's uh, once you have built that as uh, as 
most of us here, I think, have. Um, it is much easier, as you know, to lose that um, very quickly than <laughs> to build it up. You know, you you got to work every day to maintain that that credibility and that trust with people, and it's uh, you know, it's it it really is a twenty four seven job. You're you're basically never off. Um, it's especially with social media and as easy access as people have to you. Um, so you know, I, I agree with that. That's so, true. Go ahead. Yeah. Bob. That's that's very true. It's a 24-7 job. Weather never stops. You move from one vent to the other, and I agree with Ryan. We've been through these big weather events in our local area, and we've experienced the sorrow, the pain. We've I know people who have been killed in tornadoes, and that that's of great value to your end user that you understand what they're going through that when I see a map in the spring that that spells out tornado outbreak I don't get excited maybe maybe when I was younger I did when I didn't understand or couldn't grasp the concept of what these storms do but the first time I visited Birmingham Alabama back in the 90s saw the back then the Fujita scale F5 tornado where there wasn't even grass left there was nothing left. When you see that, that changes you. When you go down and help in Hurricane Katrina or these other disasters, it becomes real. So when I see those maps spell something that looks ominous, I get a sick feeling in my stomach. I don't like it. I don't want to deal with it. I don't want to work it. But that's my job. And I agree with Ryan. We've been through these things, and that's how you build trust. And uh, another thing you mentioned about it's easy to lose trust is I'm up front, very honest with my followers. Uh, I'm, there's no such thing as a perfect forecast or forecaster. I can get 80% of the snowfall forecast right, but where that band sets up and you end up getting 8 to 10 inches when 4 or 5 was expected, some of these things are out of our control or knowledge base that we just can't you know, always get right. But if I miss a big forecast, I'll be the first one to apologize and say, this is what went wrong, I got it wrong, and this is why, and we're all going to learn from it. Yeah. I think that's one thing, real quick here, I think that's yeah. one thing that um, the NW, everybody in, in the enterprise, just as a consumer, I will say, is, is something Bo just said there. Here's where we missed, and here's why we missed, and here's what happened, and here here's why we missed. You know, we were talking before we came on about how a couple years ago we had a cold front moved through and it was supposed to be 31 degrees by noon and then 30 degrees by 2 o'clock and the temperature literally sat at 33 degrees for 12 hours and never dropped and we ended up with four and a half inches of rain thankfully instead of ice but I think that that's important and, and this bugs me in sports with with officials and things like that is is I think it is important to say look you know we miss here's why we missed you know and, and you guys all do a great job of this span does a great job of it you know, here's why we missed, and here's what we're going to do to get better. But I think that too, you guys have got to, um, you know, not be really hard on yourselves. And 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 like Bo just said, y'all are going to miss. I mean, I'm I miss predict sales every other month. It seems like I'm I'm off on my projections or our budgets off. We're all human, and, and we're all going to miss. And I think it's important to not beat yourself up, but. By the same token, you know, I think it's important for everybody to own it and say, hey, you know, we missed that forecast, and here's why we missed it, and here's what we're going to do to be better next time. Yeah, right. I agree. I, I, agree. Yeah. 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 I think ramping up is another thing that we need to learn is to ramp up, not down. If you come out with a forecast four days out about yeah. a big snowstorm, where do you go from there? You, you, right. can't, you don't go anywhere. You have to ramp down. And my philosophy is ramp up. I do not want to be caught in a situation where I have to ramp down. It will happen. But my philosophy is ramp up to the event. Don't go hog wild four days out because the weather maps will likely change. Yep. Um, so I want to take the last couple of minutes here before we close out because I promised from the very beginning that for those who are watching and seeing you know, some of these graphics coming across their Facebook feeds or whatever, what can, what can the general public do 
to handle, how, how can they handle these situations where they see? Now, a lot of people, obviously, from the poll that we took, a lot of people are totally writing them off. They're not sharing them. That's great. That's that's fine. Um, but for those that do have questions about them, um, in my blog yesterday, I, I gave about three different steps that you can take, and, and uh, I've probably thought of a couple others since then. But um, my philosophy on this is when you see one of those graphics, maybe that has the swath of potential heavy snow 10 days out, right, you know, through the Ryan's viewing area and the Memphis area. Um, first of all, beware the share. In other words, if don't share it unless you are certain that what is on there is valid. And you have to take a couple of other steps beyond, you know, just knowing what to do with it. You have to take those steps to figure out if it is valid. Um, the second one of those is to find out if it's valid, and that is that is best done by checking with your trusted sources, as we've talked about a couple of times tonight. Ryan is great. Bo is great about responding to questions that come in. Um, you know, so if you're not sure about it, ask before you share it. That's that's the biggest thing. Um, and I always like to use the philosophy on those as well that you should start off skeptical, um, because more often than not, what is being posted on one of those, unless it's coming straight from one of your trusted sources, mouths or feeds, um, is very likely either not going to happen or it is a exaggeration of what could potentially happen. Um, so those are the big ones and I and and one other that uh, that I'll throw in here as well is because we have seen graphics and forecasts from previous years even maybe with the same date stamp being recycled um, you know coming back up on January 5th from last year the graphic came out if there is a timestamp on it, for gosh sakes, check the timestamp before you share it, and make sure that what you're what you're sharing is uh, at least current, if not uh, exaggerated. So, what what other do you guys have? Any other uh, Ryan or Bo? Any other key points there we can pass on to those who are watching? I was trying to find examples. That's what I was looking for. I know there's recent the last few days. There's been the last thing you talked about is people sharing old posts. I've seen that multiple times. One was a Georgia one, and one was a St. Louis forecaster. And that St. Louis forecaster <clears throat> has had to spend a lot of time putting out that fire. But he did have a timestamp on him. But you know, people they don't see it. You know. Yeah, I just share it. Yep. Great. So uh, any. Any other uh, parting comments before we close out tonight? You guys have any other last-minute thoughts? I, I just think that, um, you know, what you guys just echo what you said. You know, if, if, it, if it looks too good or bad, depending on your, you know, your perspective, um, of, and will you snow, for an example, if it looks too good to be true, it probably is, especially more than about – you know, we, we don't even get to around here, you know, snow forecast can vary within a couple hours. I mean, you know, it's uh, – we're in a kind of odd situation, but if it sounds too good or too bad to be true, it probably is. If, if you use that philosophy, as Eric said, the, the instant skeptic, um, you know, you know, if it is – you know, if it has never snowed 25 inches in Memphis, chances are – it's not going to snow 25 inches in Memphis. I don't care what a model says, even a couple days out. So, just that you know, just that if it sounds too good or bad to be true, it probably is. I think that's a good way to kind of keep yourself safe. And there, there it is. <laughs> there's there's don't the ever, map. Ever share this map? <laughs> don't share it this year. Not next year. Not the year after that when it pops up again. Never, ever, ever share that map. You know, they there's a. Uh, they have those things called uh, that that James Spann is uh, has quoted called crap apps. That's yeah. what I call a crap map, yeah. uh, and I've, I've labeled it as such and put it in a blog. That one there is not one <laughs> that you want to share. I love the below average snowfall for Miami. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> that was, How that exactly negative. does it snow negative inches? Negative inches. <laughs> it's falling up. That's All right, guys, I've got a newscast yeah. to get to. Ryan, thanks so much for joining us tonight. Really appreciate it. Peace out. We'll uh, see you on the other end of the snow forecast. All right, see you guys. All right. Thank you. Bo, thanks again for uh, joining us tonight as well. I uh, appreciate your input and, uh, and uh, comments that you had here. And um, we'll do this again sometime. You were a great. great guest. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. And, John, always good to speak with you as well. And uh, we'll hope that uh, we don't have too much snow coming up here Sunday that we have to dig out from. So. Well, I, I have a feeling we'll be okay.
All right, uh, that's it for memphisweather.net. I am meteorologist Eric Prostius. Check us out on the blog for the latest uh, discussion of any potential snowfall, not just the forecast, uh, blog.memphisweather.net. Of course, check out our, uh, our apps as well uh, on your uh, iPhone and Android. Um, and uh, Bo, would you tell people where they can find your information as well? Sure. If you go to Facebook, it's under Bo Dotson Weather, and my name is spelled B-E-A-U. And you can also go to weathertalk.com, and that'll get you to my blog. And on Twitter, it's just under Bo Dotson. All right. And that'll wrap it up. Thank you, everybody, for uh, joining us, and uh, we'll see you on social media. Have a good night.